Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the already 17th ERM Lunch Talk organized by JPI ERM Europe. The ERM Lunch Talks is a format where we gather people from research and innovation, practitioners and other ERM actors uh, in and around our program uh, that we think should meet and share their knowledge on a, on a specific topic. And uh, what better day to do that than uh, on a Friday for lunchtime? So I'm, I'm your host for today. My name is Johannes Riegler. I work with the management board of the JPI um, Europe. With me today in the back end is are also uh, my colleagues Lina and Amanda, who are helping out in the backstage, so to say, with the tech, and Jonas and Caroline, uh, who are helping out with the chat today. So and Caroline is also a mastermind behind this ERM lunch talk series and did a great job of pulling everything and everybody together for today. So thank you, Caroline. Yeah, I hope everyone is tuned in by now and is good and is looking forward to the weekend. Uh, keep your comments, ideas, and questions coming in the chat. We will take them up as we go. And um, yeah, as many as you probably know, the JPI um, Europe is currently developing its upcoming program. It's a European partnership uh, with the European Commission. Uh, this topic which we are addressing today, regenerative green urban areas and circular economy, the donut economy and circular transitions will be one of three um, program lines in this program. In that sense, today's urban lunch talk is also embedded in a broader process of dialogues and workshops, which we are organizing throughout the year. Um, besides that, we also have funded uh, quite some projects which, which go into, let's say, into this pillar or into this uh, thematic orientation of today's lunch talk. And we will hear of some a little bit later today. I'm happy, I'm very happy today that uh, we are also joined by uh, Maria Beatrice Androek, Chi, I hope I pronounce it correctly, who might give us a bit of a framing for the topic. So Maria works at the Department of Planning and Design Technology of Architecture in Sapienza University of Rome, and is also a member of the steering board of the Urban Europe Research Alliance. Um, yeah, Maria is also about to publish uh, uh, or to launch a book, I think in May, Rethinking Sustainability Towards uh, Regenerative Economy. And so Maria, I think this fits very well to today's topic. And maybe you can give us a little bit of a framing on, on the topic. Thank you very much, Johannes. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm based in Rome. So today is a very sunny day. And I think it's a very good opportunity to discuss this concept of regenerative economy, uh, having you know, a bright mind and a, a lot of goodwill uh, to discuss this topic. Uh, I think that uh, we should, uh, if we want to understand and grasp uh, this concept of regenerative economy or circular economy embedded in it, I think it's worth uh, reminding that uh, the whole concept of uh, sustainability uh, actually dates back to 1987. And uh, after so many years, maybe uh, we have to reflect a little bit on uh, what we have been doing and how much uh, we have been progressing with sustainability. And actually, what, what we need to, to understand is that maybe uh, considering the increasing issues and challenges we are facing today, uh, sustainability or thinking in terms of sustainability could not be enough. Um, because the whole concept of sustainability, at least the way that uh, Mrs. Brundtland was uh, proposing and every uh, country was somehow backing uh, as a concept, referred to doing, uh, you know, having impact, uh, the minimizing the impacts uh, uh, when transforming the urban built environment. Uh, and in general, the ecosystems. Uh, certainly this fact of uh, uh, doing less harm is somehow insufficient today. So we need to think bold, we need to, to be very ambitious, we need to raise the bar. And I think that the concept of regenerative economy somehow can help us a lot with this respect, because this is something that implies necessarily to do more good instead of less arm. So I think this is, this is a very good uh, frame in, in which we can start our reasoning. And I hope this is uh, something which will excite you as much as it excites me. 
Thank you, Maria. Um, you see from, from this short intervention that the topic or addressing the topic is quite complex and therefore brings potentially a number of dilemma situations. And you, as if from the invitation or from the, from the concept of this, this lunch talk, you might have seen that we will discuss also the, the dilemma approach or the dilemmas behind regenerative um, urban development, let's call it like this uh, in today's meeting. And I, I, before we enter the discussion, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an outline what, what we understand by under that dilemma. So JPI on Europe is following this dilemma-driven approach very much. Um, and uh, what we typically define as an, uh, as an urban dilemma are two or more competing goals, such as uh, stakeholder interests, related strategies, which potentially fail to achieve their aims as implementing one strategy might hamper or prevent the achievement of another one. So actually we, we aim at, um, yeah, looking at exactly these kind of dilemmas, um, trying to, uh, not to solve them, but to address them um, to get uh, urban transitions going. Before we go um, into the discussion today, I would also like to share my screen very quickly with you. Um, because for, um, everyone who's not speaking today, we would still be very interested in your um, expertise, opinion, and, and um, perspectives on this topic. So we would really like, um, like it if you would um, go to Mentimeter. We have set up a, a couple of questions there to um, related to today's talk. Go to menti.com enter this code, which you see, you, you will also see that in the chat, or I think someone posted it already of my colleagues in the chat. There are a couple of questions and we might come back to them later on today. Good, one second. So I need to re, re just my screen here and stop the sharing if I find the right button. So here we go again. Okay. So today's guests um, of this lunch talk are Daniela Rizzi, who's a senior officer at, uh, uh, for nature-based solutions and uh, biodiversity at ICLE uh, Europe. Dan uh, Daniela has a doctoral degree in landscape architecture and planning and is currently involved in a number of EU funded projects around the, uh, how to measure nature-based uh, solution, solutions impact. Hi Daniela. We have Volker Kors from the uh, Hochschule für Technik Stuttgart. He's representing the GBI on Europe uh, project in source and this project uh, helps decision makers identify and visualize the food, water, energy systems and their interrelations for urban strategic planning investment. Hi, Volker. We also have Thomas Nails from the Technische University Berlin from, vertical, from the Vertical Green Project. Uh, this project re, um, aims at redeveloping vertical green of urban areas according to stakeholders' needs and different types of uh, architectures and climates. And last but not least, we have Daniel Black from uh, Daniel Black and Associates, who's working on bridging the gap between research and practice um, in the uh, Waste View Urban Living Lab project. So welcome to today's guests. Daniel, maybe we start with you. Um, what dilemmas and frictions did you come across in your project? Sorry, was that to me or Daniela? Yeah, Dan Daniel, to you, Daniel. Um, so yeah, there, we had, there are plenty of dilemmas um, all over the place. Uh, just by way of further background, for those that are unfamiliar with our project, the, the Waste Fuel Project is seeking to significantly reduce inefficiencies in the food energy water nexus across four urban living labs in Bristol in the UK, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, Cape Town in South Africa and Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and in Bristol, we're working with five key partners, uh, the company that manages the city's wastewater infrastructure and treatment, the city council's waste and recycling company, and three specialist NGOs in energy, food and waste resources. And through a, a series of quite prolonged discussions with those partners, we've, we've identified three core challenge areas. 
The first is in household food waste. The second is in plastic contamination and commercial food waste, or sorry, plastic contamination in commercial food waste. And the final one's phosphorus, uh, which is for those unfamiliar, a finite mineral and essential for food growing. And, and Europe is more or less completely reliant on foreign imports for, for phosphorus, and it's going out to sea at a, an alarming rate. Um, but I'm going to focus just on the first one in terms of the dilemma, the household food waste. So uh, there's, a, there's been a UK study that suggests that uh, an average household with children throws away 60 pounds worth of food per month. Uh, of usable food and so for a, for a city the size of Bristol half a million people that's around 36 million pounds per year just in monetary value and that doesn't include social and environmental costs and so in our project uh, one of the dilemmas we've come across is through the use of economic valuation so the first economic valuation we've we've undertaken is an environmental valuation and it suggests, perhaps not surprisingly, that it's far more efficient to reduce consumption upstream rather than trying to recycle it downstream. Obviously, that's part of the waste hierarchy. But particularly in terms of carbon emissions, eutrophication, which is algal blooms from water pollution and air pollution. But the real dilemma was when we undertook the macroeconomic valuation which looked at the potential job losses and income reduction from reduced food waste. And what we found was it would significantly outweigh any environmental benefits. Um, and so by using those sort of fairly, well, even non-traditional valuation, because we used an environmental valuation alongside it, uh, the environmental impacts, uh, when you put them against the economic impacts, the environment effectively lost. Um, to put it another way, it makes economic sense to waste food. Um, so we know ex instinctively that can't be right. Uh, another example could be coal-fired power stations, um, you know, significant job losses. It's a very cheap fuel, but we know we had to have to shut them down um, if we're gonna uh, address climate change. So to summarize, the one of the dilemmas we're looking at is that our, our current valuation mechanisms are working against us. Something uh, which also comes up in the donut economy model, right? And uh, looking at that. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, Thomas, from the, in the Vertical Green Project, you're involved in looking at um, into stakeholder needs and factors uh, like different architecture and climates for greening buildings. What, what, what is your take on this? Where do you come across the, these points of frictions in the projects or in the case studies uh, in your projects? Hi. Well, um, regarding the dilemmas, one example is that um, we we go to green the quarters, and we are yeah looking for technical solutions which are able to green even growing cities and even dense cities. And one dilemma which we came across, for instance, is that these living walls, which are um, very high highly appreciated, which are nice, which have a high aesthetical value. Um, on the same time, they, they have a very high material and, and energy demand. And actually, if you look for the lifespan, and um, right now we don't have good data for the lifespan, but if we um, would expect them to have a lifespan of 50 years, then they would be a carbon source and not a carbon sink because uh, you need so much um, gray energy to produce them um, that it makes no sense to install them uh, for terms like um, climate change mitigation, for instance. Might be an adaptation, but uh, it might be more, more sensible to use a, an air conditioning system. So that mm -hmm. is one of the dilemmas where we could show that uh, design matters and not only regarding aesthetics, but uh, also regarding the function and the impact. Just as one example, you, I think you mentioned another one, which is uh, um, you green the quarter and then the, the rents go up. So in terms of economy, this is perfect. It's a perfect measure uh, to, to earn more money. 
the question is if we want that from a social point of view. Um, we had a very interesting discussion about uh, limited rents, but it was finished yesterday. So there's no opportunity for the counties in Germany, for the states to, to limit uh, rents. So I think that, that what we found is like technology, ecolo ecology, and then um, the society, and especially the economy. There's really some, some dilemmas coming up. If we, even if you have a look for some very detailed things like a uh, FS8 greening system, not mentioning water and space yeah. and all the other things. Huh? Thank you, Thomas. Very, very interesting insight into, into, into this project. Um, Volker, the Insurance in, in project aims at helping decision makers to identify and visualize the food, water, energy systems and their interrelations, right, with strategic yes. planning and investment. So what, what, do you, what do you come up with, um, if I would ask you for the hardest nut to crack in terms of dilemmas in the project? Thanks, because I would not like to start with a dilemma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, just gives you an, an idea what we're um, doing. I think it's a little bit different from, from the other project. We basically, um, you could say, try to connect um, digital twins from different sectors from the water system, from the food system, from the energy system on different scales to it's more in, in that sense, a data modeling and integration approach. And we have use cases in New York with, um, with the aim to support the development of a zero carbon district in Brooklyn with a huge expectation of population growth. Um, one use case in, in Vienna and one in, um, in Ludwigsburg, which is more focusing on say um, connecting urban and connected urban and rural areas. And um, the integration per se is um, interesting and also I would say um, works quite well, but it shows um, the problem that even if you have this say integrated view where you can see where you can take and, and also take measurements of the different sectors still in the planning process and people still focus on their sector because I guess they are very familiar with and even with this tool it's very difficult to um, to take the other sectors into account in your planning uh, so um, we can show the, the relations and the, the, the connections, but still people tend to work in their domain, I guess, because they're used to. So it's, it's very difficult even um, to, to, and that's maybe the dilemma, even if you know that and all agree that these connections is, it's very difficult to take them into account in, in the planning. For for example, we, we had the, the focus on, on the food sector where people are used to, um, not so much take into account the CO2 equivalent of food transportation, but the required land use, yeah, which is also a very important factor, um, but it's not straightforward or we, did not have a solution yet for this to say, okay, but can can we um, make, a, say, some kind of calculation to say, what does it mean in, in CO2 um, equivalence or so? And to give you, you an example that was from, from Vienna, from our partner Boku there, that's something I found really surprising um, with tomatoes. Transportation is from, if you um, import tomatoes, it's from CO2 equivalent, more beneficial compared to grow tomatoes in, in the local area because you need much more heat <laughs> and much more water. Um, and that consumes all the savings you have with transportation. And that's a clear conflict with, with shows the difficulties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not a solution yet. But <laughs> So it, it, it again comes to, to the measuring of the whole, um, comes down to measuring um, yes. yeah. things. Um, and I think that brings us, uh, links very well to Daniela. Your work focuses on measuring the impact of nature-based solution and geographical. Your geographical focus of your work is uh, Europe and Brazil. 
Um, and what barriers and dilemmas have you encountered in your work? Have you encountered any dilemmas which, um, which are like the others which have been laid out? What is, what is your take on that? Yeah, uh, we, we, we all have so many dilemmas, right? <laughs> that makes our work interesting. Um, yeah, one thing that I think it's worth it commenting is um, I think we are very much um, in the environmental agendas always talking about carbon, 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 carbon. And I always like to provoke, um, and I think this year this provocation is going to become bigger and bigger. Where is the talk about biodiversity? So when we talk about, for example, um, looking um, at you know the whole cycle um, and the energy demand, um, um, like like my colleague here said uh, of, for example, green roofs or green walls, um, people do come to the to the point. At, although that's also it's a lot of discussion around it, but many many experts say oh, it's, it's too high demand in terms of, of materials and in terms of energy. But we cannot forget, you know, the, the, the whole di dimension of biodiversity, you know. Um, biodiversity is not only important outside cities. Biodiversity is equally or even more important within cities because of the whole awareness um, dimension of it. You know, people live in cities, and if they don't get in touch with biodiversity within cities, they would not care about it with outside cities as well. So I think that the whole discussion around design that fosters biodiversity in cities should be put, <laughs> you know, in the balance, and we should not only talk about carbon the whole time. We know that the climate agenda is very strong, but I, I kind of fear that uh, the nature agenda, you know, the biodiversity agenda, it should be as strong as talking about carbon, right? Um, and in the sense, I think, um, yeah, so the dilemma here, it goes along with financing as well. Like when, when we had the Paris Agreement coming in 2015, people started, you know, all, and when I talk about people, I'm also talking about banks and about financing institutions, people started calculating, you know, what um, the whole the whole carbon um, emissions thing. So they, they have all these protocols to calculate things. And I really hope that this year with COP15 happening in China, that we put up ambitious protocols for calculating the high price of not protecting nature, of not caring about biodiversity. And, and the links to COVID-19, for example, it's all ignored as if the equation had nothing to do with biodiversity. So I just think that uh, raising this provocation this dilemma. Thank you, Daniela. Um, very good. Um, I really like that you that you span from the local to the global on, on back again, maybe a little bit. Before we open up for the discussion in, in this group, I would like to uh, ask you, Maria Petrice, what do you, what do you take from this, uh, these points put forward or this, this experiences? How does that link to, to your work and what you found out of what you're putting in this in this publication and, and, and other the, uh, discussions which you have in your era and so on? Yes, thank you, Johannes. I think my colleagues already highlighted several very, very interesting points uh, worth uh, reflecting on. I will start actually from the one mentioned by Daniela on uh, the trade-off between attracting new investors and uh, supporting circular multi-scale transformation, leveraging our natural-based solution and urban green blue infrastructure. And unfortunately, the business as usual funding mechanism uh, that can be absorbed most of the time. I think there is this timing mismatch between the long-term approach which is needed for full effectiveness of natural-based solution for regenerative cities and neighborhoods and districts, and the search for a very quick financial return on investment, which of course is it's a matter to be uh, addressed at different level, but mainly a uh, political and systemic uh, way. And the other very interesting point I think that I capture uh, that I'm facing on almost on a daily basis is the trade-off between uh, uh, normal uh, beautification aspects uh, embedded in natural-based solution and especially the most fashionable ones 
and the actual risk of gentrification, because of course, um, most of the time, I mean, at least the one that we observe in Italy, I'm making specific reference to Milan, for instance, referred that when we make neighborhoods and districts resilient and attractive, uh, through fashionable natural-based solution, we may end up losing inclusiveness and equity. And this is certainly something uh, we do not want to, to face. Um, certainly, there are also excellent uh, positive examples. I mean, if we look at the Ruhr Valley entire uh, regeneration process, uh, uh, entire brownfields and, and degraded urban centers are becoming really thriving uh, urban economies. So somehow I'm, I'm very positive, but I think that again, as my colleagues have been highlighting, planning and design is very, very important and matter very much. Thank you, Maria. Um, I would like to, maybe can just uh, feel free if you, if you want to uh, refer to a comment or a point by, by a colleague, um, that's usually why that's usually why we like this urban lunch talks because it's it's basically a conversation among among people working in the same field. Um, but I, I would like to ask you to uh, to all of you because I think all of you are are involved in very local projects uh, in a neighborhood uh, in an urban or you work with urban living labs, uh, have different case studies. What how do you how do you address these dilemmas? Or how can you make it practical? Um, how would they play out? How you address them? Or what do you think is, is required to address them? Um, I would just uh, open the floor up to, to anyone who, who wants to contribute. Daniel, yes, please. Um, thank you. So, I mean, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? I guess the, the meaning of the term dilemma is that it is, it's not easy. Um, I mean, in, in relation to what I was talking about before, valuation, valuation, I think touches on everything. It touches on urban greening, it touches on, I assume, digital twins, it touches on the ecological crisis. Um, and the first thing I'd say is that even though economic valuation is only ever going to be a partial uh, way of putting value to things, I, I do still think it, it, it has value in and of itself. Um, so in the projects that we've used, it, it's helpful to communicate uh, the scale of issues, uh, the importance of issues in, in quite simplistic ways. Um, but there is a danger to using it that you can, um, I think often people either dismiss it or they think it's the answer to everything. And it's neither of those things. Um, it, it, there's, I think we need to develop new ways of doing valuation that incorporate a whole range of different uh, techniques. Um, so. But I guess the first message I'd say is that don't give up because uh, it, it, dilemmas can seem some, sometimes uh, impossible to overcome. Um, yeah, the second point is don't, don't dismiss economic valuation, but, but do bear in mind that, it's, um, that it is only ever a partial, partial means of, 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 of valuing things. Thank you. Maybe in, oh, yeah, terms, yeah. in terms of maintenance. Um, because I'm thinking about nature-based solutions as well, uh, again, like um, if governments plan nature-based solutions, um, they usually have to assume the maintenance costs of nature-based solutions. Um, and the thing is, if you think about upscaling it, you're not doing one green roof or one green wall, you are spreading it all over the city. You need really a lot of maintenance. Um, so maybe a dilemma here would be um, if, the, if the public hand can really um, be in charge of all the maintenance costs. Um, I, I work with a lot of projects on the ground and what I have been seeing is that it is extremely important to involve citizens. And it, it's not only about discussing how they want they, their own, you know, neighborhoods to look like and, and, and awareness and everything, but maybe also involving citizens in maintenance. I think this is something that is coming up more and more in nature-based solutions projects. So you, you see urban gardening, you know, people meet in urban gardenings, they, they flirt, they get to, to know someone, 
Um, there is the grandmother that uh, has been inside uh, her room the whole time. She goes and meet people. Um, children can participate. So there's this whole this civic approach to it and the, you know, the public engagement approach. Um, and there are other kinds of nature-based solutions where you have this you know, social um, meeting um, aspect. So the dilemma is here, how can you use the interest of the public in these structures and at the same time, um, make sure that maintenance, um, you know, can be delivered. Like, is there a way to, you know, um, to, to do upscaling of nature-based solutions and still make sure that they're gonna, you know, not die in the, in the next week, but they're gonna be there long-term. Very good, thank you, Daniela. It's the first time I heard the, the reference from urban transitions towards uh, flirtation in a, in, a, in, a, in a public garden. That was, uh, uh, was an interesting take. Uh, Maria, you raise, uh, raised your hand. Yes, on this maintenance point, which is very, very relevant because, you know, sometimes uh, people simply forget, you know, we, we, the, we do something which is very nice, but also very functional and very effective, but at the end, nobody cares what's coming after the implementation of the project. And my recommendation also uh, as a landscape architect is that we should actually designed for maintenance. I mean, it's not something that comes, you know, uh, to be uh, addressed afterwards, but it's something that should be, you know, directly uh, planned and designed since the very early stage. I think this is uh, actually one of the main problem uh, whereby we face gentrification, because uh, if you design something which is becoming so expensive to be maintained, of course, we will not be ending up uh, with something which is for, for all but just for few. Again, I'm referring, sorry, to, to Milan, to one of my home city. And the other aspect is on the funding, because I think that uh, there is, I, I, I was looking at the chat and I noticed uh, the comment, a very interesting comment on carbon credits. And I actually think that we are still too much on the polluters pay principle and we should actually shift uh, to more incentive-based mechanism. I think we should give award to people who are putting in place virtuous projects instead of say punishing or allowing for market of uh, say uh, polluting practice. So this is, this is um, my perspective on it. Thank you, Maria. Um, on this discussion of biodiversity, most people also imagine that uh, nature is something far off where wildlife reigns, and uh, few would probably think that it's on the on the doorstep. Uh, and connected to that, uh, Thomas, you put something in the, in the in the chat here. Nature should not need any maintenance. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, what what I uh, mentioned before. So nature-based solution solutions should not be more complicated and should not be more more technological in the end than the uh, former technical solution so i think if we if we focus too much on the very fancy the very nice stuff um then this 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 will be not the right solution i mean we have the problems usually we have the technological solutions for these problems and if we now go to substitute the technical solution by a nature-based solutions uh, or, or by nat nature-based solutions which need more maintenance and more impact and which have a higher carbon footprint then it makes no sense just just to do it because it is green or it is so nature-based you know what what we need to to discuss is or yeah what we need to do is to critically ask is, is that really a nature-based solutions? Is that really um, taking up ecological um, functionalities, ecological um, yeah, fundaments or not? Or is it just a greenwashing in the end? Mm -hmm. So in one, one way to do that, for instance, is to, because we talked about maintenance costs, we, can, we, we should not just focus on the cost of maintenance of a nature-based solution, but to compare it to a technical solution on the long term. And uh, saying that uh, people are, are doing the maintenance, if that is handwork, which is not uh, connected to too much 
um, energy demand and and uh, uh, carbon release, then why not uh, working? I mean, in a good sense of working quality. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the, the point about maintenance I'd, I'd echo is a, is a huge point and, and actually related to a project we did, not, not the project we've I was talking about before, but a separate one called Upstream, which is on health and the links between urban environments and health outcomes. And there are very significant costs potentially associated and increasing evidence linking, um, you know, mental health in particular and access to nature and all that kind of thing. So there are ways of putting additional value to this, to these sorts of uh, interventions. But the point of maintenance is huge. Uh, I mean, to give you UK as an example, we've got this situation in the UK where um, the private sector don't want to control any of the public space, the public realm, because of the maintenance costs. The local authorities can't afford to do it. And so we're in a kind of limbo land at the moment where no one really wants to, to take, take ownership for it. And yet it's so essential. So it is uh, the maintenance aspect is, I just echo that it's fundamental. Okay, you raised your hand too, I guess. Yes, and uh, adding to this, I think, yeah, in uh, nature itself, I agree it doesn't need maintenance, but in in with urban green, I think it's not really nature, <laughs> because we kind of um, it's it's human made nature, right, <laughs> in that sense, um, and we have the the the, the conflict and. Uh, um, we already discussed solutions in, in our project that um, by climate change, we have more and more dry periods in summer, at least in, in, in Germany and um, Austria. And, but I think it's, it's generally in, in, in Europe. And we have a higher water demand per se, and we see this, this impact already. And we had some some cases where people were not allowed to use um, water for, for gardening purposes in, in summer periods. And that will, if we use more and more urban greens, that problem will not be, that needs maintenance for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, there are several ideas to um, make much more use of gray water systems, especially for, for um, this urban gardening or for urban green, put it this way, it's not only the gardening can be um, others as well. Um, and I think these are valuable solutions because um, I was told by, by um, experts in biology that you can, that um, with gray water, you need less water because you have much more nutrients in the water compared to fresh water. So that can be an optimization as well, but it's on the other hand, also big investment because you need separate um, pipes and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, I think I think this 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 conversation also touches about uh, about um, or, or taps up on an interesting or um, notion that maybe uh, or a question: Where does nature start and where does it end? Right? Isn't isn't it uh, like? Um, um, we, how, what, what do we perceive as nature in a city? What is, what is, uh, how can we combine that in a, in a, in a better notion, which is not this uh, limitation between human and nature, but, but somehow addresses it from a, from a more holistic um, way, maybe. Um, I, saw, I saw you raising your hand uh, uh, briefly, uh, Daniela. Yeah, I, I was just because we're also thinking about circularity, right? Um, and um, Volker, what you just mentioned with the, you know, some cities, they really have water um, so shortages. I mean, I come from Sao Paulo. I sure know um, that water shortage can be extremely um, dangerous for, for a city. You know, we almost have a situation some years ago where the whole city of Sao Paulo um, counting 23 million um, people, almost the whole um, supply system almost broke, you know, it was like the reservoirs were extremely low and we almost had really like a situation where, you know, some, some neighborhoods even really had um, no water for some time and it was really terrible. Um, but then I think really like it's, it's actually a kind of a crime 
that in these days, wastewater is not considered as a resource as it should. You know, I think it's unacceptable. Um, and then I'm talking about nature-based solutions again, because um, you, you have to, to, you know, to put the, the topic of water reuse and, 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 and see like, how can you, um, through also nature-based solutions, make it possible to, to do um, recycled water reuse. Um, and then, of course, to do irrigation, we should not use normal water to do irrigation, you know, we should use recycled water. Um, as as um, you said, because of the nutrients and everything. So it's it's like use the right water for the right um, um, reasons, like the, 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 the demand um, for the water purification for the different um, aspects, right? So I think this is something that um, we should embrace. Uh, we cannot talk about regenerative neighborhoods if, we're, if we don't talk about water. Right, it's it's what everything starts in a sense. Uh, you cannot live without water, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Maria Beatrice, and then we will have a look at the menti. What came in from the audience? Yes, actually, I I totally agree with this. And what we can notice almost on a daily basis is that whether there is a lot of emphasis on energy when dealing, say, with positive energy districts or eco or neighborhoods and districts, not at all the same can be said for water. And I actually, uh, I, I fully agree. Um, we are facing also in Italy uh, water scarcity. So th there is a double problem. I think there is a problem with quality and a problem with quantity. And actually urban design and architecture do not take that into account. A concept like water footprints, so say embodied water in, uh, in urban transformations are not taken into account at all. And, and certainly dealing with natural based solution, we do have the strategies to implement, say, through xeriscaping or other strategy, the way to make our ecosystem resilient. So I think this is another aspect which is very much linked to climate change, because, of course, we will have uh, two to different kind of problems. We will be having, say, storms and other, say, uh, very dangerous uh, weather uh, uh, phenomenon. And at the same time, we will be facing scarcity of water. So it, it's uh, really a, a dilemma that we have to face. Uh, again, I think that planning and design can, can help a lot in here. Thank you, Maria. Um, I would like to ask my, my colleague Caroline, um, I have, um, if there's something, uh, if something, a question or a comment was mentioned in came via the chat. I, I, I didn't follow that, um, the chat here. Yeah, hello. There are plenty of comments in the chat, a lot of side talks, Excellent. Whispering, whispering behind the, behind <laughs> behind the, the stage, so to speak. <laughs> um, well, we had, we, we came back to this regenerative aspect at one point. Paula uh, picked it up and said, should we not only, um, should we not mainly focus on the reduction of our ecological footprint and from that search for the best solutions, both spatial and social. Uh, and um, I think that picks up a bit, um, not just doing less harm, but doing more good in a way urban areas maybe have to uh, payback from the years where we did too much harm. <laughs> it's time to give back and do more good. Uh, and there was also a comment around um, a key to, to citizen engagement is responsibility. Maybe there's a link here, I don't know. Um, but other than that, I think the Menti has been quite active, but I'm not sure, Johannes, I think you can share that. Yeah, I will share that. I didn't have a look, um, uh, in-depth look, because that was not possible while um, <laughs> talking to you guys, but we will do that now on the fly, so to say. I will, you should see my screen again, mm -hmm. I'm here, excellent. Then I need my glasses and then we go. Um, so what came in from the from the uh, participants? Feel free, all the speakers, if you, if you find something very interesting, just uh, raise your voice and we, um, reflect on the points which you see in the Menti. So we have here capacity building. People like the idea of regenerative economy, but they don't want to reduce consumption behaviors. 
Is it the people? Is it is it is it the industries? Who who are they? I would I would would come to my mind. Finding the current uh, correct balance between local and global food systems. That's an interesting. Working towards non-binary food systems. Johannes. Yes. So on the point on densification, I, I was going to mention that in relation to you know nature and where did that stop and start. Uh, again, we had a, a separate project that was looking at how, how can the real estate industry invest in compact cities to reduce carbon emissions? And, and this kind of, again, another dilemma between how do you try and get the right level of densification whilst also allowing access to green space and the natural world is, is, uh, is a challenging one. It's not impossible, obviously, but it seems to be in practice very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let me just read them while we're going through them. I think we should also not forget the cities are competing among themselves. This is a, a very crucial point because of course, um, having more people availability means having higher consumptions. And if you think that there are countries, I don't want to mention any specifically, but there are countries who are actually forcing people from, from the countryside to move into the cities uh, just to boost consumptions, because uh, these kind of urban economies are somehow focused and, and strictly depending on a double digit growth uh, goals. And so and this is a big dilemma because certainly having a more, uh, say, um, balanced between uh, urban and peri-urban or, or rural areas will certainly help in terms of finding a balance. But, but how does this combine with pure economic uh, urban growth objectives? Do not have much, uh, much answer to that, sorry. <laughs> No, I'd, I'd 100% agree with that. I think that's hugely important. The competition between cities is a and, and growth. I mean, a couple of cities that we're working with in, in the UK, Manchester and Bristol, and it's the same for every city. You know, again, it comes back to jobs and income and livelihoods. You know, it, you have to remain competitive and th those drivers tend to be short term. Very good. We have some some more more uh, dilemmas in the in the Mentimeter, which are very. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid we cannot uh, address all of them, but be assured that we will take them up in the further um, process in, in in our internal process and stakeholder dialogues. Um, and we will have a workshop, which I'm gonna mention later on. Uh, but we will use this as an input. Yeah, and we have a question in the chat. Yeah, uh, from Bob which I thought was very interesting. It goes, many of the dilemmas raised seem to point to the importance of framing issues more broadly to capture synergies, uh, mm -hmm. which are often greater than trade-offs. But our institutions are not set up for broader framing. They are in their silos. What strategies might change this? Here comes a, a do or a don't, or what strategies are needed for this? Can I do a provocation here? Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you for, for raising that. I think that's such an important topic, you know, that we stop to, I'm the engineer, I'm the architect, I'm the landscape architect, I'm the ecologist, and, and etc. You know, we should really sit together and listen to one another and try to, you know, and thinking about local governments even more. Like if this happens already in the academia that you see the Professor X um, put in a fight with the Professor Y, you can imagine what happens within cities, right? Uh, departments uh, and because of budget. So, you know, the department of, I don't know, streets and infrastructure has a huge budget. And then the department of green has like a, a smaller budget and then the, the the fight is even bigger, you know, for the big chunks of money to, to put up schemes. So mm -hmm. I don't really have the, the answer for this, but I can say that uh, um, I do believe that nature-based solutions has the power to be a concept that is in a sense 
quite um, can be embraced by very, very different kinds of professions and very, very different kinds of departments so that we put these people to discuss, you know, on the same table. They, they sit on the same table and discuss. Um, and many urban living labs that we have been carrying out in the projects that we are working on, they do exactly that. They put the street department, transport department to talk with the environment department, to talk with the health department, and just to hear one another, you know? So um, I think that uh, the concept can be helpful, you know, a new concept that can mm -hmm. fly over a lot of different, across different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniela. You make my life very easy because you, you already bridged to the next uh, Menti question, which is uh, what is required to address these uh, dilemmas. But before we go into that, uh, uh, Volker, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I totally agree with this, what Daniela says. But our experience is that it, the, the universities or some kind of, say, neutral party can have a big impact on, on the decision making within the city because um, if you do something, uh, somebody starts an initiative within the city in his or her department, then the first question is, why is this happening? Who's is he responsible? Is it his or her task or whatever <laughs> responsibility? If you provide kind of a neutral ground and your university can do that and invite different people and try to try out things and start this discussion, um, it's much easier for the, the stakeholders also to participate. Yeah? So I think that is very valuable and in a way um, also kind of doable. Yeah? It's not that you have super high investments or so. Thank you for that. Um, we also asked Anamanti, what term would you use to summarize today's topic? Um, so there's only six participants uh, who, who, who um, answered this one. So there's still uh, room to grow if you want to contribute something uh, later. But you see here, sustainable transitions, nature-based solutions, reserving resources, conflict of use, and planning societal trade-offs and inclusivity. And we see more coming in as we speak, reserving resources. Great, um, as we have a... That were very interesting points and very relevant points. I will sh uh, stop sharing the, uh, Daniel, I see your hand. Uh, one second, I just stop sharing the Mentimeter. Um, it's all over the place here, sorry. So, okay. Um, that anyway brings us already to the, to the final round um, of comments of all of you. So, um, if you if you would summarize this this discussion today, um, this discussion in one word or one sentence or maybe three sentences, how would you how would you um, summarize these discussions on dilemmas on this topic, Daniel? I hope your point which you wanted to make uh, addresses this question. Otherwise, I'm sorry that I uh, didn't give you the word before. No, not at all. It, it sort of does. I mean, I used to, I put this in the Mentimeter, but societal trade-offs is probably the closest I can come to uh, some kind of phrase that sums it up. Um, but what I was going to add in summary to that, and it's in response to the, the comments in the chat that from Bob Webb, um, it, it is a real challenge, I think, for academia in general, bridging across different disciplines and with, you know, practitioner partners. And certainly in the UK, it's changing very rapidly. Um, the UK RI as it is now is, is pulling together all the different research councils and there's a lot more focus on transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary working um, and a, an increasing focus on impact, but there's a long, long way to go. And I think institutionally and, and all the rest, there's just our, our structures in place, you know, gear, gear academics towards PhDs and high, high levels of specialization um, and for me, I can't see really obviously where the generalists are that enable the, uh, that level of um, systems-wide thinking and view, you know, wh where are the institutions behind that that are, that are focused on the societal challenge. So I think in terms of a possible growth area, I think it would be great. I mean, and we are seeing lots, lots going on in that area. So the, the more that we can see towards that end, I think would be great. Thank you, Daniel. 
Volker, what would be, how would you summarize this discussion in one word or, th or, or, or a sentence, maximum three sentences? Two words, connecting sectors, maybe. <laughs> okay, very good. Daniela, what's your take on this? I'm gonna be a little bit more aggressive, um, breaking silos, mm -hmm. breaking walls. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe we break the walls first and then we connect this, uh, the sectors which are uh, hidden behind them. Uh, with, that links to focus comment. Thomas, what would you, what would you say? Well, I think in terms of the nature-based solutions, what is, I mean, that's a framing, okay? So we, we should not go too much into details about that, but um, what is really interesting about it is that it brings back the systemic view uh, to, to solve not only one problem in one time, but to have the whole system in, in mind. And what the nature-based problem is, or what I think what, what the good thing about nature is that it, that it has the freedom for failure. And if we really think positive about nature-based solutions, if we really want to integrate them, that means that we have to integrate that, let's say, opportunity of failure and ev on end of evolution, which is imminent for, for nature. And I think that that is really changing our mind and planners' minds and uh, politicians' minds, if we really take that serious. That Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Maria, how would yes. you wrap that up? Yeah, thank you, Jonas. I think that is very important building evidence and capacity. And I see that the two are very much related because I think that on the one hand, we do not have enough evidence of say the multiple benefits that can be taken out of uh, implementing natural-based solution and green blue infrastructure. And, and I think that if we are able to produce at different levels, I mean, people level, uh, decision makers level, researchers level, I think in this, way we will also be able to build capacity because of course uh, if, if we I mean if, let's make an example if decision makers take decision without knowing all possible option all possible solution that would be able to in, Implement. Of course, this decision making is a, is a big problem. And the same is for designers and planners, because of course, most of the time, they are not aware of the many benefits that can come out, especially as was written in the chat about synergies. Because the studies already we know, we know, but we are, of course, in a different uh, uh, environment, the research environment. We know that there, there is a lot of evidence in terms of how much good uh, and in terms of regenerative approach can do natural-based solutions mm -hmm. in the urban built environment. Thank you so much, Maria Beatrice. That, uh, my take on that, uh, what, I, what I hear from how I would sum it up, that there's one, one besides we had, uh, way broader discussions on that. But what I found cr uh, critical is how we understand and we envision what urban sustainability is or what, what it could be. And the dilemma behind uh, or between those or those approaches who see nature as something else than human and those who understand the planet as one and humans as nature. And we, I would like to, to um, that brings us almost to the end of this, this urban lunch talk. I would like to share my screen one more time with you, if I may, and invite all of you to one of our upcoming events. Um, so we have, we, we are organizing Agora Thematic Dialogue. Agora is our stakeholder involvement platform. It sounds very technical, but it's basically a, a larger version of these kind of discussions which we had today um, with a bit more agenda. Um, but we have one coming up on unfolding dilemmas of regenerative green neighborhoods. And you're all more than welcome to uh, join this. My colleague Caroline will pop the, the link to the registration in the chat. Uh, you will find more information on this event there as well. And I believe Caroline, you have something to share as well uh, with, the, with the audience on the next event. I will now. share, to be honest. And uh, that is that we have, we're experimenting with Slack a little. I don't know if you know that space, but it, uh, we will use it as a chat forum to follow up when we have a dialogue. 
it's sometimes very abrupt to quit an event like this and you feel like you're just getting started. So we have a space there, we will drop a link to you and you can continue some self-organized chats there too. Uh, it's coming in the chat here in a second, but we will also leave the webinar open for 15 more minutes if you want to discuss a bit more here. Great, thank you so much, Caroline. With that, it's we are right on time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for sharing your, your insights and your uh, experiences and approaches. Um, again, we would very much like it if we continue this discussion on Slack by email in one of our upcoming events. Um, yeah, with that, I wish you all a great weekend. I hope you, you, you take this discussion. There's some food for thought or where you can think over uh, these points which were mentioned on the weekend. And I hope to see you next time. And uh, last but not least, Caroline, great work for putting this all up and uh, pulling everybody together. Thank you so much for everything. And see you soon. Happy weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Very good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye.